Well, close to good afternoon. Good to see you all. Um, today I'm going to talk about something the Biden administration has been avoiding discussing for a couple months now. The humanitarian and security crisis ongoing at our southern border. The United States is on track to have two million migrants cross our border by the end of September. That's about twice the population of Delaware, President Biden's home state. 172,000 were apprehended during March, the most in a single month in more than 20 years. You notice the sharp rise on the chart behind me here, the display. The CVP actually had to extend the y-axis just to accommodate this historically high number. We currently have 20,000 unaccompanied children in our custody, the highest figure since the statistic has been tracked. Just in the past several months, two suspected terrorists were apprehended attempting to cross into our country. About a month ago when I was at the border speaking to the Border Patrol agents, they told me about those that they have apprehended on the terrorist watch list. When I came back and presented it in the press conference, we had Democrats, colleagues of mine actually call me a liar, challenged me because they believed they had the same security clearance as I did for the knowledge of what they would know. They were proven wrong, never once apologized, but worse, never did anything to stop it. And since that time that they have been notified, we've now found that two more individuals on the terrorist watch list from Yemen have been apprehended. And they weren't together. They were on separate days. The question rises, why were they coming? Who brought them here? Who were they going to meet with in America? And what did they have planned? for us? I think these would be the questions of the Vice President as well, but she's yet to go to the border. I met uh, yesterday with the CIA Director, talked to him about some of these issues as well. The amount of fentanyl seized this year increased by an alarming rate of 233% from the same period last year. When I was at Monument 3 in El Paso, looking just down the fencing there, the agents told us that they've never seen so much fentanyl as they have during the last month. Now, fentanyl is considered to be 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine, and if altered, become even deadlier. We all know last year that 90,000 Americans died from drug overdose. How many more will die based upon what has happened on our border? Now, instead of bolstering our security to counter these serious vulnerabilities, the massive flow of migrants have actually weakened our security along the border. By this, if you traveled there, you would get a clear feeling and understanding. If you just look at the Rio Grande Valley, 40% of the agents who normally would be securing the border, they're not even on the border anymore because they are pulled off the regular patrols to take care of families and children. So with all the families and children coming in, the border is even less secure because fewer people can be there to protect it because now they're caring for the children. I don't know if you've spoken to many of the members who have been down to the border, but some of the stories that are coming back are very alarming. One member told me the story just last week. They went on patrol at night where they apprehended some illegal immigrants. One of those immigrants was on her plane flying as she was coming back here to another part within our country. Never tested for COVID. Don't know why the individual is being moved to another location. And don't know why you come into our country at any time illegally is correct. Now with all these red flags, with all these problems, with everything we know that's going on along this border, that even those leaders of other country from the president of Mexico and others declaring that President Biden has created much of this, Speaker Pelosi just last week claimed that the United States is on a good path at the border. The question I asked the Speaker, if we're breaking all records, more fentanyl, terrorists, and more people illegally entering than we've seen in more than 20 years, if that's a good path, what's a bad path look like? Now, Vice President Harris, who President Biden appointed to oversee the border, has yet to actually travel to the border and has no plans to do so. 
My understanding in the speaker's press conference, she gave you no plans as either of the date that she would travel to see the security of our nation. Now being notified that yes, those on a terrorist watch list have been apprehended on our border and have been represent California like she does as well. That's where they found two of them from Yemen. Now, if the Democrats need a set of reality and some, some solutions, Republicans have here to offer them. Five easy things we can do. Finish the wall and deploy technology to the border. When I talk about finishing the wall, we've already paid for it. We're actually paying these contractors not, not to finish it. If you just look at El Paso, there was going to be 150 miles of wall built. They finished 133 miles of it. They stopped midnight January 20th told to stop. Now there's just openings for people to come instead of protecting the security. Fully reinstate the remain in Mexico policy. Even the president of Mexico himself understands what President Biden has done, calling him the, calling him the immigrant president based upon his removal and change and causing much of this problem. Maintain and robustly implement Title 42 authority. Require a COVID negative test before releasing any migrants. When I was in El Paso, we had just toured a new facility that we had built about a year ago, 98,000 square feet processing facility. They built it so large they thought they would never meet capacity. That day they met it that soon. Man, 120 agents were not able to protect the border. They were there. The children that are all put together never being tested for COVID. And that day that we were there, they was notified that they were sending 1,000 to Midland, 3,000 to Dallas, not notifying the mayor or others, and moving them into the communities not being tested. Now, I don't believe Democrats are interested in solving the crisis their own policies have actually created. If President Biden had sent Vice President Harrison in charge, the first thing you think she'd want to do is to go see the, where the problem lies. You believe that she'd want to solve it. There has been no legislation that changed. It was only the orders of the president himself. He can solve this problem very quickly. But this is more than a humanitarian problem. The number of times you see children crying left all alone. The agents themselves, who are mothers and fathers, told me a story of coming upon Three children, the age of one, three, and five. Nobody around them for miles, in tears. We just watched last week a young child crying coming up to an agent. I believe his age was around five, saying he did not want to be out there alone again for another night. For a child being dropped over a 14-foot fence. When you would question and ask those were sitting, you asked them, why did they come? They told us, because President Biden told them to. Much of this could be stopped. Those who are being harmed could be protected. And just as importantly, all those who live in America could be protected by making sure terrorists are not getting through our borders. Now, we may not agree on much when it comes to policy, but President Biden and I certainly agree on this point, that it is a terrible, terrible mistake to make. And this may not be where President Biden believes today, but where he believed when he was a senator, to change the size and scope of the Supreme Court. And to put it in question, if for an entire decade the independence of the most significant body, including the Congress, in my view, the most significant body in the country, the Supreme Court of the United States. I still believe that. I wish he would believe that as well. Just as we speak today, right now, I know Democrats are holding a press conference to announce that they plan to dismantle a government institution in pursuit of their socialist agenda. To totally take over another branch of government to have control purely for a political basis. Their legis legislation aims to expand the Supreme Court by four seats. That makes a real difference, four seats. Ironically, it's the same number needed to give Democrats a one-seat edge and the President Biden the power to appoint 
four justices. Never in my time in politics did I ever believe they would go this far. Never did I think, even if my disagreements with Democrats, I question, is there a moderate Democrat left in the party? Does power mean so much to you that absolute power corrupts absolutely? That you will change the course to capture another form within a judicial power simply to control more. And they proudly put it forth as their agenda. It doesn't come from someone sitting in the back. It comes from the chairman of the Judiciary Committee. This is their agenda. This is their hopes. But this is what's wrong. With that, take it up for question. Yes, sir. Um, the House Judiciary Committee has oversight of the Department of Justice. So is it appropriate that when a member of that committee is under investigation by the Department of Justice that they stay on that committee, like Representative Gates? Are you referring to is, is Matt Gates going to stay on committee? Matt Gates is, uh, is the same as any American. He's innocent until proven guilty. There's no charges against him yet. If a charge comes forward, that would be dealt with at that time. He yes. Oversight of the Justice Department Just to follow up on that. that. Is there anything that could come out in media reports before the probe concludes that would push you to, to remove? That's a hypothetical probably. question. I'll deal with whatever issue as it comes. As of right now, um, Matt Gates says he is innocent. There's an investigation going on, and I'll let the investigation take care of itself before I take any action. Mr. Leader, have you spoken to Congressman Gates? Yes, I have. Can you tell us more about that conversation? I've spoken to Mr. Gates about the accusations. He's told me he's innocent of the accusations. I he explained to Mr. Gates the rules inside our um, conference. If there was something to come forward, we'd take action. And did you speak with yes. him? Uh, you already addressed the Congress later this month. There's going to be a limited number of tickets. What's your understanding of how the tickets are going to split up, how many tickets Republicans are going to get, and do you anticipate that you will be attending? Uh, I do not know anything about the tickets. I don't know how many they will allow in there. Uh, yes, I plan on intending. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Leader. Um, you've gone down to visit with former President Trump a number of times um, at Mar-a-Lago. Can you tell us a little bit about um, his mood and perhaps his interest in helping uh, Republicans win back the House and Senate? And on that note also, can you say, do you want him to continue um, taking on some of the leaders um, among the Republicans here, Liz Cheney or Lisa Mikowski, and targeting them for defeat? Uh, a lot of questions in that. Let me tell you. Yes, I have met with the president a couple times. He's always fully engaged. The president engaged in um, a recent campaign we had to fill the seat of Luke Letlow, and his engagement actually helped win the primary early. Julia Letlow was uh, Elected and sworn in yesterday, very excited. First Republican woman from Louisiana. Um, very impressive. In a 12-person um, field, she won in a primary with 65 percent of the vote. Mathematically, almost impossible, people would say at times. Uh, the party was very united there. As of right now, there is a three-seat majority for the Dems, or really two. She can only lose two in the three. That's the smallest it's been in more than 100 years. Um, pretty successful for Republicans in that basis. Um, I don't know all your other questions that you had there. But I would tell you this, too. Uh, just as I sat down with President Trump, I'd like to sit down with President Biden. I've actually requested meetings on the border crisis. Never had a meeting with the president. Never spoken to President Biden since he's been in or elected. I spoke to him many times when he's vice president. I know he speaks of bipartisanship. I'd like to talk to him about infrastructure. I'd like to talk to him about the border crisis, since he, nor he nor his vice president, who he's put in charge, have gone to the border, been there. I'd love to discuss what we saw, what we heard from the border agents themselves, tell them some solutions, some ideas to get things done. But unfortunately, President Biden, I don't think, believes in bipartisanship. Uh, the number of, of times I requested the meetings, he's never even acknowledged it. So. What kind of role are you expecting the former president to play in your efforts to win back? The like all other former presidents, they, they help. They engage in many different ways, be it helping um, getting the word out, raising money, and others. I expect no difference. And do you want him to quit attacking Liz Cheney and the others? 
I think the best thing, the number one thing I want to have happen is make sure the next century is the American century, and I know the policies that President Biden's doing is putting in greater damage. If I just look around the world today in these few short months, we have a crisis on our border that we have not seen in more than 20 years, not created in any other way but a change in administration. And I've just watched that the president now has called back two ships from going to the Black Sea. I don't know how Putin responds to that he's, he builds up 80,000 troops along the border of Ukraine. I watch China, our adversary, and Russia get stronger as President Biden changes the energy policy in America. I watched Americans get laid off, that he ends the XL pipeline but does nothing to stop Nord Stream within Russia. Even though Congress, on a bipartisan basis, passed the bill to put sanctions, he chose different sanctions and a weakness. So I do know if the next century is going to be ours, we're going to have to change administration. We're going to have to change Congress, where we have a speaker today who thinks the border is in good shape. That's my focus. Yes, sir. Um, on proxy voting, um, that's been extended through uh, May 19th, if I remember correctly. Um, you've said that you would like uh, things to return to normal. I'm curious, A, if you think that should be the last extension, and B, for the members of your own party that are using it, have you, will you tell them at some point to stop using it, given uh, what you want to There's four to things we need to do. Get Americans back to work, back to school, back to health, and back to normal. And I think the first place you should lead it is in this House of Representatives. More than 75% of that body has been vaccinated. There's a number of them that had COVID, uh, that have not been vaccinated. If you go into the Senate, you don't have to wear a mask if you're a manager from the House trying to impeach somebody, but if you're in the House, you still have to wear a mask. I don't know the difference in science between the House and the Senate. When you speak in the House, there's nobody else around you. I'm not quite sure. I look forward to the day that when Congress changes, that you have to show up to work to be paid. That will be one of the first things I will do. We will not vote by proxy. And the other thing that would be interesting to have happen is that bills actually go through committee. So voices that constituents around the world, around the country, lend their voice to their representative, they could actually be heard and have input on bills. So you would not support another extension? No, I didn't support the creation of it. If we are essential through all the history of America, through war, through plagues and others, even within the Civil War and Capitol being burnt, we still showed up. This is the first Congress that can't. I've watched congressional members be on a boat and vote. They're with their family out on a boat. They're still getting paid. And they zoom in for a vote. That's appalling. And members of your own party that are using it? People should be here to work. There, there's, going, there's an exception. If there was an exception out there, I'd say Dan Crenshaw has the exception because he's not allowed to fly, because he has to sit face down. Because of his dedication to this nation, yeah, he was injured and his eyes hurt. That's the person I would say would have an exception. Yes. Well, let's give it to our favor. All right, we got a list. We're going to guess what you're going to ask. When, when Paul Ryan was speaker, yeah. his staff... Or we're looking forward... Well, We're going Paul can I, Ryan, can okay. I ask my question? Yeah. When Paul Ryan was speaker, his staff had a, a conversation with Matt Gates about his professional conduct. Okay. Were you ever aware of any no. red flags, any concerns about his conduct when you were majority leader? Uh, when I was majority leader, I wasn't part of that discussion. I didn't know about that. Lots of times as um, speaker or leader, if you have discussions with members, I guess, for the privacy, they have that. I did not know about that till the um, art until I read it in the article. No, he, 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 there was no red flags that his, about his conduct raised at all or your staff. I, I, did not, I did not know that conversation. or I don't know what that conversation was either about, just what I read in the paper. In general, his behavior, his conduct, was there anything raised to you? Uh, you'd have to see Matt Gates. I, I, if you, if you wonder if I knew anything about what uh, is being alleged now, no. All right, you all have a nice day.